All right, thank you so much. Let's go ahead and get started. I'm gonna pass it over to you, Andy. Better unmute first. Thanks, Heidi. And hi, everyone. And uh, welcome to our roughly annual, at least this time of year, um, policy update, where we try and take a look at important policy issues facing us, especially at the state level. But we also sometimes try and touch on federal issues and sometimes local issues. Today, we'll focus mostly on state. And we have Steve Falk here, our partner with Environmental Law and Policy Center. Um, to cover some of these state issues. I might jump in as well. And then depending on how we're doing it time later, I can cover a little bit, especially of an update of the infrastructure bill that did pass and some of the energy related um, and climate related provisions there. And then maybe we could, depending on time again, we could talk a little bit about Build Back Better, which as we all know has not passed and we don't know where it's at. So um, that's an even bigger unknown. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass this off to Steve here. If everyone would please, Put your questions in the chat as we go, and Heidi will probably jump in then, and so that Steve doesn't have to be watching that constantly, jump in as we go from topic to topic, because Steve has a number of state-related issues here that he's going to cover, but if you have questions as we go, let's cover them as we go rather than wait till the end so we don't have to be jumping around between topics. So um, and with that, Steve, go ahead. It's all yours. Thank you, Andy, and thank you, Heidi, and, and everybody up in uh, Winnishik County. I'm coming to you from Des Moines, which is a balmy 37 degrees out, <laughs> and the sun is shining and the snow is starting to melt. So that's always a good sign around here. And I know that uh, you guys have a little bit more challenges up north. Um, but as Andy said, I wanted to kind of give a preview of what's going on at the state legislature. Since this is the second session of the General Assembly, that means the bills from last year that did not make it through the funnels uh, were re at the end of session, re-referred back to committee. So these bills are still alive. And there were uh, a few bills of interest uh, in, for energy in Iowa. I know that if we had a different set of policymakers in charge, this list would be extremely long. But as it is, it's not as long as we would like it to be um, if things were different. But the, the biggest issue carryover from last year, of course, is the solar income tax credit. There were a total of five bills uh, filed last year to deal with the income tax credit, increasing it and dealing with the backlog. Four of those bills were introduced by Democrats who are in the minority. Uh, three were in the House. Representatives Bohannon, Eisenhart and Stade each had a bill to deal with the backlog and increasing the uh, sales tax credit for solar energy systems. And then Senator Bochum uh, in the Senate but we, I said I was able to get uh, Representative Jared Klein from Washington County to file a bill that did increase the tax credit and took care of the backlog. Um, and, and that bill would have moved if there was, if we thought it would pass the Iowa Senate, but the bill did not move uh, because we got pretty clear signals that the Iowa Senate was not gonna be taking up anything solar related uh, and tax credit related. Um, so that bill is still alive, but it does not look like it will move because nothing really has changed in the Senate. Uh, but I did want to allow Andy, uh, as long as we're talking about the tax credit, to kind of tell about what uh, he's been up to and doing. And there might be a window of opportunity. We'll see for uh, at least take care of the backlog. Yeah, thanks, Steve. I'll just mention the update here. And, and really important, we do have an action um, web site on our webpage, on the Energy District, Winship Energy District webpage. If you go to resources and advocacy, it's pretty easy to find or just connect with me. And we are focused specifically on funding the waiting list. So we're not, last year the debate was had and done and over around extending Iowa's solar tax credits, and that's not happening. Um, but the tax credits were theoretically in effect through 2021, and a lot of folks, homes and businesses, invested, believing they had that tax credit through 2021, but because there was an annual cap of $5 million and the, the whole tax credit was oversubscribed, the end of 2021 rolled around with a backlog, a pretty serious backlog. Interestingly, the way that tax credit was set up in Iowa 
the commercial applicants on the backlog will continue to get paid. They will get paid their credit over the next year or two. Um, the residential folks on the wait list potentially are facing, and this could be 1500 or so or more, potentially are facing just losing out that tax credit altogether because the wait list wasn't funded. And as of January 1, 2022, there are no more funds in it. So the, to fix that, the legislature would have to appropriate dollars to pay the wait list for those residential applicants who installed solar essentially from about mid 2020, right on through 2021. None of those folks as it now stands will get their solar tax credit unless the legislature acts. So there does seem to be a window of opportunity there. The legislature doesn't want to extend the credits, but just paying that what most folks saw as a promise um, is important. And our Senator Clemish and Representative Bergen um, are working on it. They say they both have bills in the hopper under development for the House and the Senate and are working with their colleagues. So the single most important thing that everyone can do is reach out to everyone you know. And if you know of anyone that installed solar from mid 2020 through 2021, as a residential system, not a business or commercial, they need to reach out to their senators and representatives, wherever they may be, and say, hey, if you don't act, I'm going to lose 3000 or more dollars. So this matters a whole heck of a lot to me. So the more that can happen, the better. That's the one piece of this we're working on. Thanks, Steve. Sure. So I want to see this resource. The Iowa Environmental Council has a bill tracker. So. Uh, Click on the May 2021 bill tracker to read the bills that are still, which ones have been signed or which ones could still be alive. And then as Andy mentioned, you know, there are bills in the hopper. So in the hopper means that they are um, at the drafters. The drafters are putting the final touches on a bill, the language, is this what the representative wanted? Once that bill is signed off by the legislator, it then is called, it's filed. And that's when it gets a bill number. It could be a committee bill, it could be a study bill, or just a regular House or Senate file. That's when it would show up on the bill tracker. Uh, Iowa Environmental Council does a, a fantastic job of tracking not only the energy bills, what we're interested in, but also if you're interested in water quality. They also uh, track bills that, that uh, uh, are, are, uh, impact water quality in one way or another. But bills that we think, we well, that we, we know of one that is in the hopper, it hasn't been filed yet. And this is one filed by ICETA. And this is virtual net metering. So this, this is, uh, gonna, they decided to start the bill in the Senate since that is the hardest nut to crack, so to speak, rather than starting in the House, start it in the Senate. Uh, so they've been in contact with the Senate committee chair, uh, Commerce Committee. Uh, Senator Schultz, he has agreed to do a, a virtual net metering bill. So that's really good news. And um, for those of you, virtual net metering is primarily for like a, a multifamily unit uh, or an apartment building or condos where you have uh, the, the owner put solar on the building and how uh, they can share that then with everybody in the building uh, that will ha be handled at the utility. They will give everybody that is on that meter credit for having solar on their building. So they can start, it's just as if they installed solar on their property and were able to take advantage of it right away. So virtual net metering is a good thing and it's kind of a precursor to community solar. So we, we see an opportunity. I think this would be a, a very good bill to, to, to get through the legislature. Uh, they're going to have a component on it to deal with farms. So if a farmer has a single meter, but he might have livestock buildings on other locations on other meters, they could get credit. That owner could get credit for those other meters. So uh, that we expect uh, that to be coming along uh, soon. The other couple of bills that we're uh, going to be looking for Mid-America wants to do what's called uh, flex rates. And this is for large electricity users like data centers or distribution centers or manufacturers, where if they, or to fulfill their own sustainability goals, they can make a cut a new rate with Mid-America 
where they could get advantage, take advantage of that renewable energy source. So MidAmerican tried to get something very similar to this through the utilities board. The utilities board last year denied it because they said, well, this is really, a, uh, this should be answered by the legislature and not us. So that's why we're anticipating that uh, MidAmerican will come forward with flex rates. We of course wanna see what the, the bill, how it's written, what are the details before we decide where we land. But we also are concerned about everybody that is not a part of the flex rates program or a large electricity consumer, then you're stuck with paying rates uh, for the coal, uh, the coal, the six coal plants that MidAmerican has. Now this would also apply to uh, Alliant. And kind of what we've heard through the grapevine is that Alliant and MidAmerican have not agreed on language yet for what that flex rate program would look like. Um, this, this idea came uh, up through, percolated up through the governor's task force on carbon sequestration. This was the main uh, idea that MidAmerica presented. They kind of pushed on it and pushed on it. Uh, they did get some pushback from John Deere what the, the John Deere representative said, well, this sounds like cross subsidization to us because if we don't uh, you know, comply or, or you know, get on board with flex rates, we're stuck then with uh, paying the, the regular rates as they are now. So not sure how uh, quickly that bill could move. There could be some opposition. We see an opportunity to maybe attach uh, the integrated resource planning uh, language. Iowa does not have integrated resource planning. And the, this is where the uh, utilities, now these are the investor-owned utilities, have to come up with a plan and present it. This is our 10-year plan or 15-year plan looking down the road. Uh, several states have uh, integrated resource plans and that's really good for consumers then to see, okay, on this uneconomic coal plant, when are you going to retire that coal plant? And we kind of push that. But we have no way of knowing what the, what the financials are on that because MidAmerica it doesn't share that information. They're not compelled to share it. If we had integrated resource planning, they would be then compelled to, to share their future plans. So we, we're thinking about how could we get this attached and it might be through Alliant that message frame because the Alliant um, is not really fa viewed favorable by not only Democrats, but Republicans in the legislature. And if we get to some key Republicans and say, hey, yeah, we want Alliant to tell us what their future plans are, um, this would might be something that could interest some Republican legislators. We're gonna use data from a study that was just complete by Synapse, and this was commissioned by uh, ELPC and IEC, um, taking a look specifically at MidAmerica's coal fleet, the six plants. And this study reports that by the year 2040, ratepayers could save $1.5 billion if they MidAmerica would retire these coal plants. So I sent the report and uh, the talking points along with this report to Andy, but I think that would be a good, if, if you're looking for a reason why we should have integrated resource planning, this is why, so that we are not as ratepayers uh, paying for uneconomic uh, electric generation, which in this case is coal. So stay tuned on the flex rates. I'm sure we'll be talking about it more as it gets filed and, and we all get to see what the language is. The other bill that we believe is gonna be coming from Senator Zumba and Representative McClintock and that has to do with solar siting. Uh, as you know, there are some solar farms, really aggressive solar farms being proposed in Lynn County at the Palo power plant. Now that the nuclear um, has been shut down, they wanna build solar. Uh, Nextera is the, would be the owner. We think this is a great use of solar energy to replace nuclear energy, but there is local opposition. And this local opposition is being fueled by a lot of misinformation that is coming from a woman from Virginia, uh, Susan Ralston. She used to be um, Carl Rove's uh, uh, top assistant. 
And she now is kind of organizing anti-solar around the country. Uh, and so that's why you know the, the, all this misinformation has been coming forward about solar energy, how it pollutes uh, agricultural land with the runoff of, of the water running across the panels that carries uh, harmful pollutants that get in our water supply, which is just all, you know, that's not true. But they're using information like that to get residents riled up against uh, utility scale solar. So it is more than just a, you know, this is a, from our point of view in, and some of us on the EF table, this is a land's rights issue, as well as we should be going down the road for solar energy to replace uh, uh, more coal or gas fired plants. So we're, we're anticipating that that bill will be uh, filed. So stay tuned. Um, and that kind of, I think at this point, uh, Andy, I would wrap up on, um, are there any questions about the legislation from the state at this point? I'll go on to a couple other issues uh, next, but yeah, yeah, go ahead, Craig. Oh, uh, Steve, the, um, tell us the citation or the group again that did the 1.5 billion uh, savings. Sure. Coal plants. Uh, yeah, and I misspoke. That's 1.2 billion by the year 2040. So Synapse Energy. Uh, is the, the uh, author of this report. And this is really good information in this. Uh, and, it, and they say that uh, Mid-America could replace those six plants with uh, 980 megawatts of solar, 700 and me uh, megawatts of battery <coughs> storage, and then 2000 megawatts of wind. That, that the storage plus these renewables could replace those six plants. Thank you. Okay, next I'd like to talk about um, hey, last, yeah. Craig, I just put the link to that study in the chat. Great, thank you. Yeah, thanks Andy for getting Go that ahead. up there. So uh, I wanted to just kind of briefly tell you about um, a new coalition that has just formed. Uh, last May, uh, Charlie Wishman gave me a call Charlie is the president of the uh, Iowa Federation of Labor. And so the Iowa Federation of Labor, of course, is a federation of uh, not all, but most of the labor unions in Iowa. And we talked about, he said that uh, his side has been talking about a blue-green alliance. And we have tried in the past, uh, since I've been around uh, since 2010, of uh, maybe getting a, a blue-green alliance uh, start a conversation and keep it going. Well, it never really gelled, but because of the administration's focus on uh, the infrastructure bill and build back better, uh, the, the president is talking about good union jobs to build these renewable energy resources. So we, we have some common ground and we have uh, been, at, like I say, been uh, a small group of some environmental groups, which include the energy districts, is now a part of this Blue-Green Alliance. There is a federal Blue-Green Alliance and we are only, we're, we're affiliated with them very loosely because we're just focused on Iowa issues. We're not gonna be lobbying Congress or members of Congress about Blue-Green Alliance issues at the federal level. We are strictly focused at the state level. Now, given that the Republicans hold the trifecta of the House and the Senate and the governor's seat, the environmental voice is not that big. Uh, we, 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 we find ourselves trying to protect what we already have. And that same, that's the same that goes with the labor unions. Um, but what we're finding is at the local level, working together, we are having an impact as the case in Lynn County. Uh, when, we, uh, when Nextera announced that they wanted to do the, the uh, solar uh, farm down there to replace the nuclear. Uh, we, we started encouraging Nextera to hire union workers and they did. They signed a letter of intent. So that plant is gonna be built with union labor. And then the Coggin plant, it's, you know, tonight is the, the third reading of the Lynn County supervisors to determine if the Coggin plant is going to move forward. 
we are we, we're advocating that they do move forward with that plant at Coggin because uh, the um, SIPCO is the will be using the solar energy generated by the solar farm at Coggin, but it's being built by their developers Clinera, and then um, well I can't think of the Andy what is the uh, the third firm that was hired by Clinera in any case. Yeah. Another another letter of intent has been signed uh, that this would be built with union labor, which is a change because SIPCO and Clinera built the Wapalo solar farm not using union labor. Uh, they used uh, third party. Um, a lot of people from out of state came in to build it from down south, and it and the work wasn't as good as it could have been. There were a lot of shortcuts taken because of that, uh, but. But we have a letter of intent signed now with Clinera uh, to use union labor at the Coggin plant. So we, we see that this is having an impact at the local level, which as our statewide siting standards, we don't have statewide states uh, siting standards. So each county has to adopt uh, by ordinance what those standards would be. And so there are Others that would like to see some very unreasonable setbacks, like 1,250 feet from solar panels being from a residence. Well, that would just really not make a lot of sense because it, that is not using the land efficiently, and you'd have to use a lot more farmland uh, in order to uh, get the same amount if you were able to build, you know, the, having the standard two to 300 feet setback. So that's just an example of how the Blue Green Alliance has been working and we think that's been a good development. And then the final thing I wanted to bring up, we've been reading a lot in the paper about carbon capture and storage through a pipeline, hooking up all the ethanol plants. We've got now three pipelines being proposed. Uh, one is uh, the summit, which is going up to North Dakota is the injection site. The, the second one is Navigator, that's coming down through, going in the opposite direction. It's going down into the central basin of Illinois. And then the third one, uh, ADM is gonna hook up their ethanol plants in Cedar Rapids and Muscatine, and then pipeline it over to Decatur, where they have an injection site at the ethanol plant in Decatur. The concern, of course, is not only the damage to the environment by having a pipeline, but also especially going to North Dakota could that, that carbon that's in the pipeline and it's high pressurized liquid uh, be used to uh, push out uh, oil from the oil sands in North Dakota? That's called enhanced oil recovery. So we do not, we do not want to have carbon emissions sequestered then to push out more carbon or hydro uh, 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 carbons for, for uh, gasoline and diesel fuel. So it's pretty controversial. Uh, EOPC does not have a position yet on the pipelines. We do support strongly the you know, carbon sequestration uh, on the ag side with carbon credits, but it has to be done right. And there has to be you know, record keeping and verification so that the carbon that is sequestered through um, corn and soybeans and anything green that grows is if they get a carbon credit that that actually is a true carbon credit that's equivalent. Uh, so just wanted to bring that up. Uh, I don't know if, if anybody has any of the questions that I uh, talked about from the, the carbon sequestration pipelines or the Blue Green Alliance, I could answer them. Steve, maybe you could talk a little bit about the economics of the pipelines too and what we were All right. discussing earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, back in March of 2021, the very first time I heard about the Summit Pipeline, Bruce Rastetter is behind that project. He was interviewed in an AP story. And he said that there are two things he needs to finance this pipeline. One is the, the tax credit, the federal tax credit, the 45Q is what it's called. They need not only having access to that tax credit, but they want to see it increased. So if it has the increase, plus he said that they would use enhanced oil recovery. He said that they would need that to help finance the pipeline. 
Well, that's the only instance, that very first AP story that he gave where he mentioned enhanced oil recovery. Every other article that has been printed or on TV or on radio, they have not mentioned enhanced oil recovery. They're only, they only talk about the 45Q tax credit. So that is a key component because that 45Q tax credit increase is in the Build Back Better plan. And that is one thing that Senator Manchin wants. He wants that 45Q um, so tax credit because he has a lot of coal in his state and theoretically uh, uh, a coal generated electricity uh, resource could qualify for that if they sequestered their carbon from a coal plant. So most of the Iowa plants are gonna be, the carbon emissions that are gonna be sequestered are gonna be from an ethanol plant uh, and perhaps a fertilizer plant. I think one has signed up, but there haven't been any coal plants that have signed up. And I think one of the reasons is the emissions off an ethanol plant is nearly 100% carbon. So the, the, the plant doesn't have to scrub their emissions in order to put it in a pipeline. The pipeline can only carry CO2. Um, and coal, you get CO2 plus SO2 plus NOx plus particulates plus metals. They really have a great expense to scrub carbon emissions off of a coal plant, very expensive. And so I think that's one of the reasons why we haven't seen a lot of chatter about any of the coal plants from Mid-American or any other coal plant, you know, saying, hey, we want to get in on that pipeline uh, because it's going to be a lot more expensive for them than if it was just an ethanol plant. And yet, and maybe you could talk a little more about this too, Steve, but Mid-American, of course, has quite a number of coal plants still alive in Iowa and is very firmly insisting to everyone involved, including the IUB and the legislature, that they intend to keep these thermal plants running, you know, in the face, of course, of national trends towards coal plant closures. Alliant is effectively announced the stage closure of all their coal plants, though Alliant has significant stakes also in some of the mid-am plants. So, of course, they're not saying they're going to close that. But Mid-American, as a Berkshire Energy company, is pretty pretty strong in insisting they will continue to operate these plants in Iowa. There are growing efforts to try and put pressure on them not to, but part of the, you know, the, the most recent statement that I have seen from the company that's significant, they just announced a big new wind farm, really big, another two gigs, I think it was. Um, they don't have to need IUB approval, real, in some ways maybe, but not for rate case because they're not coming in to rate base the, the farm. But in their materials on the wind farm, they make a big emphasis of saying, okay, this is part of our process of going towards net zero emissions for all of our Iowa customers. And then if they're going to get towards net zero emissions, of course, they need to address the emissions from their coal plants. And they say, so then our major priorities include carbon capture and storage for our thermal plants, which we intend to continue running indefinitely. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? What are they, how are they going to do carbon capture and storage for all these thermal plants? You know, that's nobody has yet really made that economically viable. What plans do they have? I, I don't know. I'm just noting this. And then, of course, the other thing we should all be aware of is the other big piece of their announcement, in addition to wind and saying they're going to continue running coal plants, is they're also moving towards nuclear. They've been talking about this for a while. How serious are they? I don't know. But anyway, I just wanted to toss that tidbit out there. And Steve, feel free to comment some more. <laughs> yeah. At the beginning of session, uh, Mid-American handed out to all policymakers a two-page handout how, you know, their, their pathway to get to net zero. So they are publicly stating they want to get to net zero. And their strategy is one of the, the pieces was the modular nuclear reactors. Now, you remember several years ago, they tried to go to the legislature to get advanced rate making principles so they could raise their rates today to pay for a nuclear plant that might be finished in 10 years from now. Mm -hmm. But everybody would be paying, start to pay in that bill today. Well, the legislature did not proceed. It, it passed the House, but it got stuck in the Senate. Well, that was when Mike Gronstall was in charge of the Senate. And while I think he was favorable to the modular nuclear reactors, his caucus 
did not want to move on it. So the bill died. And then that, that's when, that's the last we've heard of the modular nu nuclear reactors until when I read it in their net zero piece. And from what I recall from the last time, it had never been tried before uh, to, to kind of daisy chain several modular nuclear reactors together. Now, this is the same technology that's in a submarine, but they wanted to land base it and hook several of them together. And that's why it's called modular nuclear reactors. But that technology on land had not been ever done yet. And this would have been the first one. And that was another argument we used about trying to put a price tag on new technology that's never been tested or tried to know what the end cost is going to be. But it will be in the billions of dollars. Well, if there are no more questions, I think we can move to the federal piece, Andy. Okay. Any any other questions on state issues? Any state issues at all? We can come back to it too, because probably don't have half an hour on the federal. Um, okay, I'm going to go ahead and share screen and just look at a couple few things really briefly. Um, if I can get to it here. Okay, can everybody see this then? Yeah. This is. Uh, this is a McKinsey look at the infrastructure. Those, so this is the IIJA, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act that did pass, the bipartisan infrastructure plan that passed late last year. This is not the Build Back Better. And uh, so McKinsey focuses on the idea that there, though it's close to a trillion dollar bill, um, this, there's about 550 billion actually is new spending. So a lot of these bills are both ongoing, essentially budget continuations and new spending. And of the 550 billion in new spending then, they break that down so we can just look at these couple of charts here into transportation focused and basically everything else. And so on the transportation focused, you can get a, a sense here uh, 284 billion in new spending. Of course, the biggest chunk of that is roads and bridges, um, passenger rail and freight. And this is important because rail is has got some big dollars coming through here. And, uh, and airports, ports and waterways, and public transit. So, you know, a lot of this highway building, the I'm gonna, I've got another slide coming up here from another group that will show that we'll look at the actual climate and emissions impacts of the infrastructure bill and then potentially the build back better. And the infrastructure bill itself is not a big climate bill, but there are some really important pieces around the clean energy transition. And certainly some of them include public transit and um, railroads. Steve, do you want to mention, have you looked at all a little in terms of the in potential impact on Amtrak? And I know you've been real interested in the possible Iowa project. Is this an opportunity, do you think? And how closely are you following? Yeah, soon after the election in November, Amtrak had a kind of a pretty good feeling that there was going to be a, a big influx of money coming their way for passenger rail. So they uh, got on the phone to talk to Iowa DOT and to Iowa City about the corridor between Chicago to the Quad Cities, from the Quad Cities to Iowa City. The Iowa City to Quad Cities, that leg is what they're interested in to get done first. And so, of course, everybody said, yes, we're interested, um, except we, you know, we have to keep the governor neutral. We don't want her to all of a sudden, oh, wait a minute, we're not, we're not getting on board with that mm -hmm. uh, passenger rail uh, policy plan. So. We're, we're not being very vocal about it, but Amtrak wants to target that corridor to get, you know, to complete it, at least Iowa City. Of course, we'd like to see it move on to Iowa City, going through Grinnell uh, to Des Moines, you know, to Council Bluffs. But um, we first have to get it to the Quad Cities and Illinois, we're waiting to hear from Illinois DOT about their plan to get uh, the finish up whatever infrastructure needs they have so that they, that's been, you know, they're signing those documents. To, yes, we're gonna get it to the Quad Cities. They get it to the Quad Cities, then it's our turn, uh, but we gotta get it there first. 
Okay, good. And that's a good point that Steve just made in terms of, you know, we don't want any of these dollars to be sent back rejected, right, from Iowa, especially if they're clean energy related and uh, clean transportation related, but I guess that's a worry. So, you know, certainly anybody that's involved in communication with the governor's office to encourage that we need these dollars. And the big important part of that messaging is we need these dollars out here in rural Iowa, all of them, uh, whether it's transit related or whether it's EV related. And that's also another danger and a worry because of course EVs have been, the whole EV transition has been a target of the ethanol industry. So, you know, there's some negatives around that. And we and yet we need our communities to be continuing to send messages that we need those dollars out here because we need the charging infrastructure. And so that's the next piece I want to look at here. You can see on this, this quad right here, there's 15 billion in the transportation portions here of the infrastructure and act for EV. And about half of that, seven and a half billion, I believe it is, is for charging. So these are grants to go out through state energy offices and others for EV charging infrastructure. So some of you know, we've had some EV charging infrastructure grant funds flowing from the state. Most states have from the VW settlement a few years ago. And a few of those dollars has, have come here to Winnesheet County and elsewhere. The bulk of them, however, have gone to the corridors, the interstate travel corridors, right? Because they've gone to facilitate the development of high-speed charging along those travel corridors. Well, that's important, but that doesn't do much for most of Iowa's rural counties and communities. And so I think another important message, hopefully as we move forward and if hopefully as these dollars flow, an important message to the Iowa DOT and the Iowa Economic Development, the IEDA, are that as they design these programs, uh, we really need them not just to focus on the interstate travel corridors. We need these dollars to flow out to rural Iowa counties and communities, including for high-speed charging. We need a high-speed charger facility in at least every county, for goodness sake, um, and, and not just to limit those dollars to the, to the interstates and the four-lane highways. So, so this hopefully will be a significant opportunity EV charging. And the other big half of this 15 here um, is uh, schools and school buses. There's a whole, there's a $5 billion earmark target for electrifying school buses. And some of that, there may be some opportunities in there for school buses to go um, low emissions, though not electric through other avenues, but electric is the focus of that. And that's a big chunk of money. So we definitely want to be working with our schools. And I'm sure the school districts are all getting through their organizations information about this. Um, but that could be a lot, of, a lot of funds, very, very helpful to help our school districts make that transition, accelerate that transition into rural electric school buses in rural Iowa. So this is an important piece of the transportation part of the Infrastructure Act. And then we can take a quick look at the other part of the infrastructure bill, the non-transportation related. Um, and you can see here, there's a lot of money in the power grid and in energy. More of this is in actually the grid and many other elements. And I've got the next slide I'll look at shows a few, a little more breakdown on this. Um, some of those will be very useful potentially to, to communities, counties and communities out here where we are. Um, others may not. There's environmental resiliency, so some funds to flow against cyber attacks. Some of this is in general, and there are also funds specific to, for example, consumer-owned utilities like co-ops and municipals to, to work on, on resiliency and, and cyber issues. So um, the, a big chunk of this also for the power infrastructure revolves around transmission. And that's really critical. If we're gonna be building, transitioning to renewables, we need both hopefully growing distributed renewables, locally owned solar and storage and everything else. But we also need large scale, as Steve was talking about, for example, the solar fields proposed in Lynn County and elsewhere. We need the large scale solar and renewables to continue to grow. And when, as that happens, we do need the transmission grid to evolve. So there is, there are some good programs in here in this power infrastructure section for the evolution of the transmission grid, including granting the FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, greater authority actually to rule on some of these interstate transmission projects that have gotten bogged down because they need every state approval. So uh, without 
delving too deeply on that. Um, this is from the National Conference of State Legislatures. Um, and they've got many organizations, of course, have slideshows on these on the infrastructure bill. But this is just a little bit of more detail on the energy programs here. So uh, state energy program, electric grid resiliency. These pieces are interesting. Research and supply chains. This is a little more detail on, again, as an infrastructure bill, this is not so much about dollars flowing to help people own solar. That issue, for example, is tax credits. That would be in Build Back Better. Big, big tax credit section and build back better. But in the infrastructure bill, it's these kind of things. So batteries are really, really big. And there are a lot of different programs, actually, at least a dozen programs, unique identified programs in the infrastructure bill around batteries, around manufacture, supply chains, recycling. So it's a great, a great opportunity here um, for universities and others to get involved in recycling and collection systems and pilot a lot of these programs. There's also, as you can see, dollars for carbon capture programs. Um, that doesn't up the 45Q tax credit. That would come and build back better. But there's still monies in here for carbon capture. Hydrogen. We're going to actually focus. Oh, we should have noted at the very beginning, but next month's energy lunch is going to be really exciting. We're going to be hearing from some folks in Iowa who, who have been working on hydrogen and what the opportunities may be. So that is that ideal energy, I think it is. Um, anyway, stay tuned for more on that. You can see their dollars here for nuclear. Um, there's a significant bump up here for weatherization as well, three and a half billion. That's going to be really important. So we'll see how quickly those dollars can flow. Anything you want to add, Steve? I've got, I'm going to look at a, just really briefly on the emissions and climate impact of infrastructure and build back better next. But anything you want to jump into on the, on the funding programs? Uh, if I could get an invitation to your hydrogen discussion, uh, I would really like to participate in that. Um, mm -hmm. I, I talked with the consultant that was uh, Dr. Wilson with, uh, he was uh, hired by uh, Troy Van Beek at Ideal Energy to do this hydrogen storage uh, uh, study. And green hydrogen, and I, that's where I wanna focus on green hydrogen, he told me that Iowa has could be the kind of the center of the country for green hydrogen development. So green hydrogen is using biomass as its energy source. There's blue hydrogen, gray hydrogen, and black hydrogen. Green hydrogen is something that Iowa could really key in on. So we're talking about in the 2030s. This is uh, out there a few years yet before it really becomes economic, but I think we should prepare for it. Absolutely. Good point. And it is Troy. Troy or Amy or one of their people who will be on with us. So yeah, that's yeah, going to be great. an exciting. And, and honestly, that interestingly, there's a program, I believe, in the infrastructure bill specific to fund electrolysis research, because electrolysis is what's needed to convert, of course, um, renewable energy, renewable electricity, and get that clean hydrogen flowing. So okay, I'm going to look. One look here at the emissions and climate impact of these federal bills. And there's a lot on this slide, but it's looking at these lines here. Annual, this is a chart of annual CO2 emissions. So not all emissions, but most, and we'll get to methane in a sec, because that's the, the next biggest piece. But BIF is the bipartisan infrastructure package. So this is the one that passed, this purple line right up here. And as you can see, between now and 2035, 36, the infrastructure bill alone does not significantly reduce CO2 emissions. It just, it just doesn't do most of the pieces that's needed. Right down here, this little blue line is bipartisan infrastructure plus the Build Back Better Act without including the piece that Manchin really didn't like, the Clean Energy Payment Program. So even without the clean energy program, payment program, Build Back Better is still a major, major reduction here in CO2 emissions and we'll see in methane. And so the reason there really, the single biggest piece of Build Back Better are those tax credits. They would continue to extend the tax credits for industry and the rest of us that as you can see right about here would be right now they're expiring, some of them, most of them maybe, you know, in the coming few short years. So existing policy then would see emissions, which are dropping, level off before potentially dropping a little bit more. 
but with Build Back Better, those tax credits would improve and become long-term tax credits, and we would see that impact right there. So Build Back Better is, when it comes to climate, is really what we need. Um, there's a lot in there. It's getting another look right now. It may get, continue to get pared down. Even as we all know from the very early stages when it was a much, much larger aspirational program, even in all the whittling down, this, the biggest climate pieces, especially the tax credits and some other related ones have remained in there other than the CEPP. So even with all those cuts, much many of the climate elements remain intact, but uh, we'll see. we'll see what happens. This first note right down here is also important because besides CO2, of course, methane is our biggest greenhouse gas. Um, Build Back Better would also include a methane fee, which would be really, really significant. If it, it's in there now, if that passes, that would be very, very significant in terms of driving down emissions. And then if you remember in 2020, actually, this American Innovation Manufacturing Act passed, which phased out 70% phase down of the HFCs. And that was actually really, really, really significant and it's working and it's gonna continue working. So those two things put together, this is an interesting note, could already lead us towards non-CO2 GHG emissions on track for net zero 2030 pathway. So that's really, really significant. But of course, much of this depends. The HFCs are already happening reductions, but the methane fee and those reductions would come again through Build Back Better as well. So with that, that's most of what I wanted to hit. Steve, do you want to add anything, anything more? And do we have questions? <clears throat> no, I'll, I'll wait for questions. I'm going to stop sharing. Unless people have questions, we can come back to this. So, so questions on state, state policy or potentially federal? Craig. You're muted. Um, I'm just wondering about how we can leverage agricultural interests uh, on some of this legislation, Steve, because clearly uh, the Democrats can't get this done by themselves. Uh, we need the Republicans. And it worked. The pig farmers helped us a couple of years ago. Uh, can that work again? I know that there's a great amount of interest with the governor and, and secretary of agriculture on carbon credits for farmers. That they, they are really, they see that as big opportunity for agriculture. And, I, and I, would, I would agree, but it has to be done right. It's incredibly difficult just to measure how much carbon is sequestered in the soil. Uh, you gotta measure down two feet to four feet, get in the root zone. Uh, so you get, so in different soil types, store different amounts of carbon. And Iowa has over 300 different types of soil. So there's just, just the, the verification or the monitoring, verification, and reporting component. <coughs> Those three, that's really going to be important. And to set up the framework, because of all the protocols, you know, permanence, uh, additionality, all of those pro protocols are, will be a part of a carbon market. There needs to be a kind of a standard that is set across the country. So everybody is operating under the same set of standards. And I think that's what USDA uh, needs to do. They need to be that setting what the standards are. And then I think there's a great opportunity for us. And just to add to that for a sec, I mean, Steve mentioned it, a number of issues that are important and having worked in, in soil conservation and with that background, I wanna stress the permanence. Um, the measurement and verification in soil testing is an interesting issue that, frankly, from my perspective, um, <laughs> you can go a lot of different routes on this, but is not necessary. Um, because we have, you could make an argument that, that actually I would be supportive of, that we have a lot of good science that shows us what the potential for carbon sequestration is, but we also know there's a lot of variability. So one field with a certain biota and, and biological richness or lack thereof and history, maybe even the same soil type as another one. And yet if you, you could measure, you could spend large amounts of money and measure carbon sequestration after a prairie planting. And 10 years later, the results could be very, very, very different. And so 
you know, who, what farmer is going to invest if they might or might not receive any return on that investment, or it might be dramatically different from their neighbor. On the other hand, in total, I think an argument could be made that says, look, we know there's going to be a lot of variability across the landscape, but with these practices, on average, there's going to be very significant carbon sequestration. And if you, we have really good science on that. And if you use some, you know, relatively conservative side of the science, you could say in aggregate, if say 10% of Iowa farmers went towards permanent no-till next year, in total, we would have within this range, we would have a really good idea within this range of what the numbers are. So the verification and measurement is one thing, and we obviously would still want to do the measurement and verification, but not necessarily tie any individual farmer's reimbursement rate to the results on their land, because that's going to, I think we could do otherwise. The bigger question to me is that permanence, because to get carbon sequestered and keep it in the soil, you can't plow the soil. You need to have that soil be essentially in a permanent no tillage state. That's how the carbon got there in the first place. We had 5% plus carbon in Iowa soils when it was prairie because it was stuck in the soils by the prairie roots over thousands of years. The minute Iowa farmers, pioneers started plowing up that prairie, we started losing carbon. And we have, there's great baselines for all this. We've been doing CRP for 30, 40 years already. Farmers have been putting CRP ground for 10 year contracts in and sequestering carbon, even if they didn't care about sequestering carbon, you know, 30 years ago. But after 10 years, they take it out, plow it up, and within one or two years, 80 to 90 percent of that carbon is gone again. So how do you get a permanence requirement on agricultural land? What farmer is going to sign that paper or contract that says, yes, I will never till this ground again, or I will use this really restrictive type of, of tillage? Or maybe you don't need a 99 year easement on land that says no tillage allowed. Maybe you just need clawbacks. Maybe you need a 50 year that says I agree to no tillage and XYZ practices and annual monitoring. But if I decide to take it, I will pay back everything I was received or I will pay back based on the current market rate of carbon. So, you know, there, these are really intriguing question marks. But to me, the permanence, having worked a lot in ag, ag conservation, that is the single biggest question mark. It's less a question of science than it is a question of economics and policies that farmers will accept. Leslie, I see you put a question in the uh, chat about the Growing Climate Solutions Act, which passed by the Senate by a great margin. It had uh, a lot of Republican support. I think that's a great first step. We need to uh, get that, you know, you know, get that bill moving. I don't know what the holdup is. I haven't been watching it closely lately, but I think uh, that had would have a pretty good chance of passing the House. So as I said, that's a great first start. Uh, USDA is already doing many of the things in the act, and this would just codify some of the things they, they have been doing. But we need that. Uh, uh, we're, the one thing the task force, the governor's task force or carbon sequestration, I was on the Ag Working Group and Iowa State is, has done a tremendous job of providing data and information to the working group. That report should be released any week now. It's supposed to be out at the end of last year and it has not been released yet. But I'm waiting to see what Iowa State has done because uh, there's been a lot of research that is in hyperdrive on this issue. And that Growing Climate Solutions Act, a big part of what it does is, is fund the USDA and NRCS to, to develop those standards and to train the technical assistance providers, both in agency and out third party, that would need to be doing that, providing that technical assistance to farmers and, and implementing the standards. It doesn't create a national carbon market for farmers yet. It doesn't create those incentive payments that would need to come in the next farm bill. Are you working on that, Steve? <laughs> Uh, we are starting to look at it. Uh, mm -hmm. We haven't actually started to <clears throat> weigh in yet with any ideas. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. We have a couple more minutes. Any other last questions? Well, Greg? I just wondered, Jim, you follow these issues a lot. Do you have anything to add? Or uh, Hi, Craig. Uh, I don't know if you're referring to me, uh, Jim yes. Martin Graham. <laughs> 
I, I'm sorry, I had to join this late. And so I, I just got in on the last 15 minutes and wasn't really able to, to hear much of the content. So I, I apologize. I, I look forward to listening to the, to the recording. I was taking a COVID test, <laughs> which turned out negative. So that's good. Oh, good. I got a positive one, but I'm coming out of it. So it's all good. Okay. No more questions. We can give everybody three minutes back. Thank Any you, Leslie. Words? Yeah, thank you, Leslie, for keeping the pressure on Representative Hen Henson. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thanks a bunch. Anybody wants to join us, let me know. <laughs> How so? How so, Leslie? Tell us. Join Citizens Climate Lobby, and <laughs> according to your um, <clears throat> your zip code, they will put you into the nearest chapter, but they organize the chapters according to um, congressional districts. So Craig is a member in Iowa City. Um, Jim, of course, is a member here. And uh, it's a great organization. So you're saying just go onto their national website, put in your zip code, get directly yeah. to you. Citizens, yeah. citizens Climate will get you there. There's two, they've actually got Citizens Climate Education also, but um, our chapter's under the lobby part. And um, yeah, you can take an informational session. And then after that, you can decide whether or not you want to join, or you can just get in touch with me and I'll <laughs> answer any questions. Great. Thanks. Super. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good Tuesday. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. See you Bye. next time.